Okay. Okay, we are back now in Genesis chapter 9. <clears throat> we Where we left off last time was um, the flood's over, and Noah and the animals emerge from the ark, and he offers sacrifices, and uh, and that's kind of where we left off last time. And now we begin chapter 9. I want you to, it's going to sound familiar as we go through it, but as we read it, uh, I want you to just to, to make note in your mind here of some differences with something with the uh, accounts that we've heard before that is similar in language, but there's some extra things here that weren't there before. So let's take a look at Genesis 9, 1 to 7. And uh, Claudette, would you read that for us? Can you see that? Is that large enough? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I give you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, it's blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man, shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image, and you shall be fruitful and multiply, increasing greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Okay, you'll notice uh, it begin this section begins and ends with the same phrase uh, that we've heard before, and that is uh, that he, God gives the command to Noah, God blesses Noah and his sons, and says what to them? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, it's exactly what he said back in Genesis 1, correct? Uh -huh. um, he creates man in his image. And you'll notice that also comes up again. This is a callback to Genesis 1. Is it 26? Um, uh, well, that was Genesis 1. Um, I don't have it in front of me. Is it like 26 or so on that area? Uh, uh, why can't I find it? I'm trying to get my Bible ready here. Hang on a second. Yeah, Genesis 28. 1. Um, Verse 28. Yeah, 26 to 28. Actually, it goes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. So Genesis 1, 26 to 28 is where he gives in that creation mandate. If you remember, he creates man in his own image, male and female, and he blesses them and tells them to be fruitful and multiply and he gives them dominion over all the earth. Mm -hmm. So let's do a little comparison here. Let's try it that way. Uh, the uh, creation mandate uh, is we have God... Let me pull this up here. Um, all right, so we had God uh, creates man and woman in his image. And God uh, gives them dominion. And he blesses them. And com God commands them to be fruitful. And multiply and fill the earth, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Fill the earth. Okay, that's where that was the creation mandate in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Now, in this passage here, it has echoes of that. Um, you have, um, we'll call this the, the well, let's call this the first creation mandate. This is sort of now our second go at creation. Mm -hmm. all right and what does he say here um he has some things in here that are a little different um actually does he does he mention i think he mentioned yes in in actually if we add further to that let's take it down to 31 what did you remember what god said about food in the creation mandate too 
in Genesis 1. Remember going back there? It says... Uh, yeah, we were all vegetarian. Yeah, he said uh, every tree with its seed is fruit, right? So it's like uh, God gives uh, the trees uh, the fruits and the, um, for food. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the first creation mandate. Now the second creation mandate we see here, and notice the difference. This is Genesis 9, 1 to 7. Um, we still have some things that are reaffirmed, such as um, that God uh, made man in his own image and um, God blessed, blesses them and God commands them, as we said, be fruitful and multiply. Okay. What's the difference, though? There seems to be a little difference in tone. He's telling no. them that, that, that every basically living thing is going to fear them because he, he's giving them animals and fish and birds as food. Yeah. So he's, he gives, he kind of brings up that God gives them dominion again. Um, but now it's fear. Um, now, um, there, there is fear, uh, and dread in the, uh, of, uh, from, from the beasts and the birds toward man. That's why, that's why the critters don't, don't welcome us when we come home and they, and they run away all the time. There's this fear and this dread that they have of us, um, and then he says, he says something about their food now. What did he say that again, Bob? What was he? What's, what does he do now? Uh, he uh, he says that they can eat every uh, fish and bird and all the animals that are, are a source of food now. Yeah. Every living thing. Every living thing. Living moving thing. Moving thing moving. shall be food for you. Huh. And I give you everything. Now, essentially, he, I don't, he doesn't mention like they, they, they can't have pigs or they, he doesn't limit anything at this point, does he? Oh. Yeah. I don't see any kosher rules here. It's like every moving thing shall be food for you. Um, but he gives them this. Um, so you can see, again, the, the, the parallels to the first part are there, but there's this added dimension now of there's a fear that's been introduced. And then the animals are now included in food for them they they, they can uh every moving thing that lives uh shall be food for you but he says something about those that live regarding how you're the, one restriction on their eating of them no, no, blood. no blood no blood why no blood because that's your life yeah no blood uh that's their life but by, by the way that's um that was a common uh, view among the pagans regarding the blood. They would drink the blood of animals thinking it would give them life. They didn't do it for nutrients, um, but believing that the blood uh, would give them life. Um, so they are to, in other words, you can, you can see how this goes. If they're going to eat an animal, what do they have to do? Kill it. They've got to kill it. You know, they can't eat it alive. They've got to kill it. And then they've got to pour out all the blood. Um, so a death, for them to, to live now and to be sustained, they have to kill. They, they, something has to die for them. Um, and then he adds another point here, uh, another um, commandment. Uh, so we have our first, this is a... Uh, um, in a sense, this is, this is sort of the first uh, law with punishment, shall we say? I don't know if we want to describe that. But it's almost like the first law code here. Uh, and what is that? Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Yeah. 
Um, so this is the this is talking about um, capital punishment. So whoever uh, sheds the blood of man uh, shall be basically put to death by man. But in other words, this is uh, capital punishment. And and if you you know how they did it back then, um, what was the yeah, they, now when they you would you would have to carry around the dead body strapped to you until it rotted. Did they really? Yeah, you never heard that? No, I never heard yeah, that. One in antiquity, I don't know which culture it was, but if you murdered someone, they would strap the dead body to you and you had to carry it around forever until it decomposed completely. Oh, that's horrifying. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I'm um, surprised you heard that. Yeah, I, I never know. heard that. That's not, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it was a cultural thing. Really? I'm not now, saying it was the Jews, but some culture did that. I remember reading it. Huh. That that's a that's very interesting. The yeah. but in the scriptures, how how did they how did they enforce this rule? Do you, you know the process of what they did? Um of how they they administered that? They didn't have electric chairs or well they um, stone people. They would stone them. They yeah. Take they take them out of the camp, right? Or is that before was that after this? So back in the day, they didn't they didn't have prisons like we have. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone committed murder. Uh, there was an avenger of blood. It was called um, uh, some a close family member or someone who was sort of their avenger. If that person was murdered, they would then have the right to go and hunt them down and kill them. Kind of like uh, vigilantes, kind of like a dead or alive kind of thing. And um, if the person was. Um, was innocent or maybe there was a mistake and wanted to stand trial he would uh, flee to a city of refuge and there he could receive a fair trial um if he if he was guilty he often would just try to run away and escape the law and uh that man could could kill him uh anywhere outside of a city of refuge so uh it sounds a little barbaric but it was actually a bit of an order to it it was um and it, it kind of maintained because typically what happens back in those days is that if you if if someone from another tribe uh, killed someone in in my family, then we would go and kill everybody over there. It would be the, the vengeance would escalate as it would go forward. And this kind of kept it controlled. But uh, but yeah, so here's this uh, from the very beginning. And you notice, I mean, it's really interesting why the difference why is this so much bloodier than the first creation mandate? Well, one thing well, that, that strikes me a little bit is that the moment they left the garden, they were killing animals. They were doing it for clothe at least. I mean, Abel no. was raising sheep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the bloodshed starts when? Cain and Abel. Yeah, Cain okay, and Abel, or even before that, when when God kills God, the sheep, right, and right. Them. but the blood yeah, starts okay. after after the fall. Once once sin enters the world, yeah. then death comes in, and the first creation mandate is remarkable. There's no death whatsoever. Uh, it's just blessing. It be fruitful and multiply. There's no fear in the animal world of them. They they eat food. Is all peace. All is good. Uh, but once sin enters, it becomes fear and violence and and bloodshed uh enters the picture now blood for shedding the blood for food and for clothing uh and for sacrifices for sin um and it's almost like every time they eat now it's a constant reminder of their sin you know and when you think about it, it's like you know we, we we're spared that today because we just pick up beef and pork and chicken in the in the supermarket but that's not how it's it, it's it's been for the first thousands of years it was if you wanted to eat some meat you've got to kill an animal I mean that's a pretty, uh, pretty intense experience to eat, um, but it's a constant reminder of the curse of this world, a constant reminder of, of the sin that has entered in, and this need that you know God, in giving Noah a second chance here and and giving the world a second chance, has not yet solved the problem. We are we are still a a, a world that desperately needs to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. um, I always so found a, it interesting. My father did not want to eat chicken because he grew up on a poultry farm. Yeah. 
He saw what happens, right? He saw how, yeah. He had uh, to do it a lot. Yeah. It's like, and you, we don't want, we don't really want to talk about things like hot dogs and the kind of <laughs> in that process. Please, that's what I had for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so the first creation mandate was pre-fall. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is, um, so really the, uh, so this is, um, we'll call it here. Um, we'll put it up here. Um, yeah, this is uh, before the fall. Um, all is good. There's no need for anything to die. Yeah, you, know, you 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 mentioned it's a reminder of this, and I find that very interesting because later on in the scriptures, it'll talk about the sacrificial system forever yeah. reminds them of their sin. So that must be a theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting. I mean, just how how bloody the old testament is you're like oh this is disgusting and um yeah it's disgusting it's because of sin that we need to do all these things and just imagine again we think about the temple when they were doing the sacrifices the kind of blood that's got to be pouring out of this place oh, yeah. um, you know so yeah um um so the it's there, there was a there was a uh a stream or a river outside the temple it was, it was said to be constantly red yeah 24 7 it's pretty yeah. gross <laughs> oh, that's a good one you know and, and remember we when ezekiel we, they have that stream coming out of the temple but it's a it's crystal clear water now it's a new oh yeah temple. no more blood coming out of it that's that's a good <laughs> word so all right let's pick it up from here uh eight to um 17 um let's see um rob roy would you get that can you see that okay yes i can then god said to noah and to his sons with him behold i establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you the birds the livestock and every beast of the earth with you as many as came out of the ark it is for every beast of the earth I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Okay. All right. So now we have this, the covenant here. Mm. Um, so this is the covenant now um, <coughs> that he, 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 he says it to Noah, but who is the, who are the parties in this covenant? Everything that was, every animal, every person that was alive at that time. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a covenant. Uh, it's it's God's covenant with. Uh, he says with not just with Noah and his offspring. Uh, every man, everything on the ark. Yeah, and and every living creature. Uh, with you, basically, as as many as came out of the ark, every creature, on that ark. Um. Every beast of the field, all the birds, and that's really like every every land animal, including ourselves, can trace our lineage back to the ark. We were on that boat um, with Noah. Every one of us here came from Noah. Um, our animals, our dogs, came from the dogs that were on the ark. Our cats, the same, and all the every creature you see that's of this land. Uh, can trace their, if they had genealogies for animals, they could trace it back to the ark. Um, so he makes his promise now to this, this new, the, all the creatures coming off the ark. Um, and what is the, 
uh, tell me about the, what does he say to them? Is there, um, what is the covenant? They won't destroy them again with a major, well, a total flood. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So he makes this promise. Pull up here. Thanks. Um, so the, the, it's an, notice what kind of a promise is it? Is it what's required of man and animals? Nothing. It's one sided. Yeah, nothing. It's an unconditional <clears throat> promise. Regardless of how we behave, um, God will never again uh, flood the earth, destroy the earth by a flood. So, uh, will he destroy the earth? Yes. 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 One more time. And that's at the very end. There'll be no more um, sort of, uh, how shall we say it? Um, remedial or intermediary judgments like this. Mm. Where God just, just starts over again. No, this is it. This is it. This is the last of the creatures, the only thing we're waiting for is final judgment when he comes and, and he will uh, return and the earth will be consumed with fire. Um, and that's the whole point of the, the, the flood versus the fire. The flood judgment is one that some of us can survive and start again. It kind of washes you clean, like, like taking a shower. Uh, the fire judgment is one of, of, of a permanent removal of all the impurities. It it's, comes to a very end. Um, if he had sent the fire judgment in the days of Noah, all would perish. Uh, there would be nothing left. Uh, he saves that for after his work of redemption. So, but that's the He will never again destroy the earth by a flood. And let's see. Then he gives a sign of the covenant. And what is the sign of the covenant? The rainbow. The rainbow. The rainbow. The rainbow. Yeah, he, he doesn't just call it a rainbow. It's interesting. His bow oh. in the sky. Yeah, he will. Oh. He, his. Uh, <laughs> I will set my bow in the cloud. He doesn't. He doesn't call it a rainbow here. We know mm. it is a rainbow, yes. but it doesn't, doesn't call it a rainbow. Uh, anyone know uh, the significance of that, or what? What's the what's the meaning of of a of the rainbow of the bow being set in the cloud? Um, well, the art. It's an arc shape like the bow, like a bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's it's really a great scene. It's it, you can first off, um, you know, the cloud. When we read about clouds in the scriptures, um, what do they typically uh, insinuate? What do they represent? Storm. Yeah, a storm, and particular of you know God's uh, God's wrath and judgment, and in the midst of His judgment when you know every time you can the clouds are coming and um the bow is set uh is like as you mentioned it's like he's hanging up his uh his bow the bow and arrow was the you know the fiercest weapon at that time and so he's hanging up his bow like he is uh he's not he's not pointing it at us um so he sees the bow and the bow is hung up. And so that's a sign. It's a sign of peace um, that he is not at war with us. He is not out to get us. And so he, the clouds come and you can feel the judgment of God, like Martin Luther and the thunderstorm. You can feel like God's about to strike you dead. And, and then uh, you see the rainbow and it's a reminder of God's promise and his peace. And he is not out to destroy us like he did before. Um, so it's really again emphasizing his grace, his mercy toward us. And and let's continue here. He says, I and when he does that, he says, um, when I bring clouds over the earth, the bow is seen in the clouds, he says, I will remember the point of the sign. What's the what's the point of a why let me put it this way? Why does a covenant need a sign? I don't know, to remind us. Yeah. It's a it, it's a constant reminder uh, uh, to the parties involved. That's why 
you know, in, when you get married, you have a sign of a covenant in the rings that you wear. Uh, a constant reminder to you that you're in a covenant relationship with someone. Um, why the Jews, they had to have, a, a, the, the men had a permanent sign in circumcision. Every time they went to take a shower, they reminded, oh yeah, I'm in covenant with God, right? <laughs> so um, the constant reminder. So God himself gives himself a sign, uh, a reminder uh, and to him. And, but really, it's, it's not as if he needs to be reminded, but it's for us to, to see mm -hmm. that know that uh, god will remember us he will not uh, he will act upon that promise and not destroy us again like he did mm -hmm. uh, okay i think that's where we left off here so any questions or comments about that the covenant the sign of covenant all right let's take a look now it gets interesting um let's talk about this next section here um bob uh thomas do you want to get uh We'll start with just 18 and 19. We'll get that taken care of, and then we'll get to the very strange story in verse 20. Just before we move on, don't you find that I, I can't make a relationship uh, or address it, but I just find it amazing that our current culture used, has a totally different thing on the rainbow. They've oh, yeah. They've appropriated that, and I'm trying to think, you know, make some, you know, amazing comment. I can't even think of an amazing comment. I'm just sitting there, you know, shocked. <laughs> Yeah, they did it. Yeah, they do it for, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the irony of it is uh, it's, 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 it's a wicked perversion of, of something. God's sign of peace and grace, mm. and it becomes a sign of pride it's, and, and rebelliousness. Yeah, rebellion. Mm. It, yeah, it, so if that's the sign of the covenant, I guess you could say it's, for lack of a better term, it's almost flipping off the sign of the covenant in a sense. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, to use a crude word, but I mean, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's total rebellion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and I, and I think, you know, they, they there's, there's an, whether it's it's the conspiring of men or of the spire, conspiring of evil powers, they that's a constant thing where they take that which God has, um, they seek to undo and the, the created order of things. And again, we talked about that before, how... But look at how the evil in the world, what it targets. It targets the very things that God declares to be good. Mm. So he makes man and woman his image. You know, he makes them man and woman very clear. The only distinction he makes in the human race is between male and female. And that's the distinction that our world is trying desperately to erase. Mm. Uh, and, and do everything they can to rebel against that uh, part of things, the order he gives, the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and the and the value he places on the children as a blessing, and yet children in today's culture are considered a curse, and they are something to be disposed of and take you know and gotten rid of. So it's just yeah, it's a, it's a lot lot going on. We are we are a messed up place, that's for sure. So I know this is probably not really the place to talk about it, but I just I thought about this as far as um, you know the in they used to sacrifice children. And um, because they, they were innocent, I'm not sure why particularly they sacrificed their children, but that's what we're doing today for sacrificing yeah. our children. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the ultimate in, I, I think it's the, it's the ultimate fruit of evil uh, because evil is, think, think about the distortion of that. What, what is more against the will of God than for a parent Who's supposed to die for his children, uh, killing his children and having sacrificing them for his own welfare. That's the ultimate in selfishness. God is the father, and he is the one who is giving always uh, and full of love, and the son as well. And, and they willingly suffer and sacrifice for our good. The son lays down his life for us, right? Uh, that's the ultimate picture of love, and the ultimate picture of the evil is, is not laying down your life for someone else. It's, it's killing someone else for your own sake, um, particularly a child, particularly your own child, uh, because that's that's the. Um, we we talked about back in the garden of how each person, um, basically abandoned their posts they they rebelled in their own they were given jobs and they betrayed uh they were traitors to their own work and that's the great betrayal uh, and the great betrayal of a of a mother is to kill her child 
that's the great betrayal. Um, and I think that's where we, I think you're absolutely right. And that, that was practiced by all the religions that was that, that, that all these evil powers always brought them to that place. At some point they got down to, they ended up killing their children. It was always that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's why, uh, someone made a great point and said that, uh, you know, when Jesus describes hell, he calls it Gehenna, and that was the valley uh, where the kings sacrificed their children to Moloch was in that valley, and that the fire is there. So the fires of hell are the fires that are burning the children of these uh, these kings to their false gods. It's uh, it's wicked. Anyway. All right, 18 and 19. Um, okay. Bob Thomas, did you get it? Yep. The sons of Noah who went from forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these, and from these, the people of the whole world were dispersed. All right. So now we're we we knew this already. Not all of it, but we knew. Sorry, we've already introduced them, but we we're reintroduced to Noah's family. So we have Noah's. Uh, family and we say all we know we don't know the names of his son's wives or even I don't think we know the name of Noah's wife either um, but what do we have here so we have the, the Noah's family we have uh, his three sons uh, Shem Ham and Japheth okay and then he makes a note that Ham is the father of who? Canaan. Hey, Canaan. Ah, that sounds significant. Uh, the only son he mentions here, kind of giving you the heads up, that what's about to happen is an important story. Uh, but Ham is the father of Canaan. And Canaan is of interest to us. Uh, because as you know, what's the significance of Canaan? Canaanites. <laughs> Canaanites. The, the land of Canaan. This is the promised land that uh, God was going to give to his people. And um, they are also the, the, the next people group, in a sense, that God pronounces final judgment on is the people of Canaan. So let's see what happens here. So these are three sons of Noah. And so all the peoples of the earth come from, um, from these three sons. So let's read the story here. Um, let's see. Um, Bob Fowler, you there? Would you yeah. get this for us? 20 down to uh, 27. Mm -hmm. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it on both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. Then Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him. He said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the Lord God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And may God en enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Okay. All right. So just like we did before, you can see the, how it's following the creation story one more time here. We have the... The, before the fall, all is good. We have that command, the mandates he gives once again. And then we have another story about well, a kind of a garden uh, and some forbidden fruit and someone behaving in a way that is uh, cursed. Um, so we have another sort of fall happening here. So let's take a look at the story, try to make, make some sense of it here. So what's the first thing that happens here, at Noah? When he leaves the ark now and he's kind of established, what what does he do now? Grew wine, uh, grew grapes and made wine. 
Yeah, he plants a vineyard. And then uh, he drinks and becomes drunk. And he is laying uncovered in his tent. Okay. All right. So this is this is not about Noah. This story, this part, the story, this is not uh, the purpose of the story is not for us to come away, you know, judging Noah in this. He's not the one on trial here. Uh, this is describing the setup for it. He plants a vineyard, he drinks, he drinks too much, and he ends up naked. But notice where he is. He is uncovered, but where is he? He's in his tent. In his bed. He's in his tent, okay? He's not out in the open. He is in his tent, okay? So he is, in a sense, covered by his tent. That makes sense. So because um, that's going to be a big part of the story and why what Ham does is so uh, detestable. So, it is interesting in a, in a little bit that before the fall, they didn't even know they were naked. And now it's, it's a, a big sin to look at another person naked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Um, he this is the whole thing of the covering. So he is he is lying uncovered. He's he's in a so basically you get a sense of that Noah as the setting starts is again we're not going to talk about the the story doesn't really address the issue of whether uh, Noah was in great sin or rebellion or if he was just doing whatever. I, I don't think this this story is really not about him. And uh, it, you really need to try to, it's, it's really giving us the setup for what's about to happen. But the point is that Noah is um, exposed and vulnerable. Um, he is, he doesn't even know where he is at this point. So mm -hmm. he's, in a, he's exposed and he's vulnerable at this point. Ham now enters the scene. And notice they keep referring to him, Ham, the father of Canaan, uh, because it's going. The curse is going to be toward Canaan. We'll talk about that. Why that would be in a minute. But Ham, uh, the father of Canaan, what happens here? He ridicules. He's basically ridiculing his father. And he, you know, he yeah. looks at his other two brothers to come look at the old man. You know, he's making a fool of himself. Yeah, he does. He does. He does two things that we're only we don't know. Some people have said that that Cam did some really horrible, you know, sexual things with his dad. There's nothing in the text to suggest that. It just says the two things that he does. What's the first thing it says he does? Well, he went into the tent. Yeah, he he sees the nakedness of his father. He goes into the tent. He doesn't. The, the tent is covering him at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and he chooses to see the nakedness of his father and to look upon it. And then, worse, what does he do? He tells, he tells his brothers. His brothers. Yeah, he tells his brothers. <clears throat> so his father, who is exposed and vulnerable and... And he, he basically, he goes and he exposes his father's shame. Really, this is the, um, I, I want to present it this way, that, that Ham is doing the devil's work. What is the devil? What is his, uh, what is he called? If you remember in the, uh, in Revelation? The accuser. accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren right this is what he does is he exposes and ridicules and accuses and he puts us to shame uh, it's what he was a was his whole scheme in the in the garden was to get adam and eve uh, to fall and to rebel and to be exposed like that we put to shame he delights and this is the devil's work um he's the devil wasn't in the wine the devil was in the accuser in Ham here. You know, you can you can blame Noah's own lustful or or indulgent heart for drinking the wine, but the devil comes to Ham and seeks to destroy his father's reputation, 
and to um, to accuse and put him to shame. That's that's how he moves. So what happens next now? Uh, we have Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers. What do they do? They hear the news of their father's shame. And what do they do? They cover it. Yeah. Notice what they do. They back uh, in so they don't see him. Yeah, they they lay a garment on their shoulders. They walk backwards. So they, instead of looking upon the nakedness of his fa of their father, they avert their eyes. They uh, look away from their father's nakedness. They refuse to look upon it. Um, and then they cover uh, their father's shame. And so you could say that Shem and Japheth, who does that? Who, who, who is the one who covers people's loved, shame? They loved him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and who is it? Where have we seen this before? Where we have the devil coming and exposing Adam and Eve. Who was it then that comes and covers them? God covered them. Yeah. Uh, Shem and Japheth, they're doing the Lord's work. You know, covering the shame. Um, it's, a, it's really a, a beautiful scene, just the way that it's done. It's so poetic as they come in and the way that they, they do this so tenderly and carefully, um, the love that they have for their father. And, and really, they, you, you come away from the story and you're like, if you don't understand why Ham is so wretched and why Shem and Japheth are so righteous, you don't understand the gospel. You have mm -hmm. no idea what God is about, yeah. you know, because the, the self-righteous one comes in there and sees nothing wrong with Ham, you know, because he stands in judgment over his father, who is this wretched pathetic old man, disgraceful, and, uh, and he comes and, and does his self-righteous work of exposing him. Um, but that's not the gospel. That's not, that's not how the Lord is. And he is so patient and kind, and Shem and Japheth really have the heart of the Lord in this, which is why they're the ones who will be blessed and, and Canaan will be cursed. So that be the same thing as, as Christ covering us with his blood for our sins. It's kind of that protective. He's covering us for yeah. out of love. Absolutely. Absolutely. Taking away our sin, covering us with his righteousness. You know, it's such a beautiful act. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where, you know, um you, you see it in so certain movies where there's like maybe like a, a woman who's been raped or abused and she's been stripped and she's just in a, a just a, such a vulnerable place and, so, and a kind man comes and just covers her with his coat just covers her up and protects her it's just a it's a really a beautiful scene and that's exactly what our savior is about you know he sees our shame uh and our wretchedness and 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 noah's shame is is his own doing um he's the one who put himself in that position um and as we are and the Lord comes and he covers us and his kindness is so great. And the devil makes us think that Jesus is like Ham, not like Shem. That, that Jesus comes and accuses us, that Jesus looks in judgment and, and, and contempt toward us. And, uh, and no, that's the devil doing that. Christ comes and covers our shame and defends us before the Father. Uh, just a great, great scene. All right, but the, the big question is, what's going on here? Is why is Canaan cursed? Though? I mean, Ham's the one who did this. Uh, why uh, does Noah curse Canaan and not Ham? There's actually an interesting reason for this. Like, I, I've often wondered this. Why, what's the? Why is that? Isn't that? Wouldn't that be more of a curse of his descendants? Yeah, so there is a, in, in the scriptures, you see a tight bond between father and son. That if you affect, do something toward the son, 
it's a direct um, hit on the father. So, for example, um, you remember Solomon went, went after other gods and mm -hmm. God pronounced judgment upon him, right? And his judgment was going to be that the kingdom was going to be taken from him, correct? You remember this? And split. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't be taken during his lifetime. It would happen during his son's lifetime. Do you remember why that was? Why God refused to split the kingdom during Solomon's reign and instead split it during Rehoboam's reign? It's for David's sake. For David's sake. Yes, absolutely. So, so Solomon is connected to David. So they're like one, just like the father, like, some, like a Trinitarian thing. The father and the son are one. Uh, there's a unity between father and son. Um, so the way that you, uh, if you are going, if a father is going to curse his son, uh, he can't do it by cursing his son without cursing himself. So it's not it's not the Lord who's cursing Canaan. It's Noah who's cursing Canaan. And so uh, for Noah. Uh, to curse Ham would be to curse himself. Does that make sense? Yep. So the way to curse Ham is to curse Ham's son, Canaan, because Canaan and Ham are one. They are. Um, so he's Canaan's going to make Ham's life miserable. Pretty much, yeah. And 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 really, this is going to explain why the the people of Canaan sort of begins the roots of this this land where they're their wretched roots begin, like all the descendants of Cain, of, uh, Cain uh, become so wretched because of their connection with their father. Uh, and that passes on. And you're right, and Canaan will, uh, it's going to be a brutal thing here. But for our purposes, we don't know what became of Ham's family life, whether it was wonderful or not. But we do know that the land of Canaan becomes a place that is under God's uh, eye of judgment uh, that will be coming and taken from them. So... So let's talk about the curses themselves. So the curse of Canaan. What is the curse of Canaan? It'll serve, uh, it'll be a servant of servants, it says. Servant uh, of servants. What does that mean? Uh, kind of sounds like what was told to Joseph's brothers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's gonna he's not just gonna be a servant to his brothers. He's gonna be a servant of servants to his brothers. <laughs> just the just the lowest place. Um, um, so he does not have a good de destiny. His it's just a curse of destiny. You know, it's uh it's really disgraceful. But the back in the I think in their in times of slavery, the many of the um the white preachers in the South would uh, reference this as a justification for slavery. Oh, yeah. the, blacks, the blacks were descendants of Canaan. I think they still do sometimes. <laughs> they really, yeah, it's disgraceful. It's absolutely disgraceful. Um, but they they would use this as a little proof text for them. Um, then he says, um, the blessing uh, of Shem. Um, notice a couple things. What does it say about Shem? That this should give us some clues here about how to read this um what's the first thing he says he doesn't um bless shem what is who does he bless lord the god of shem yeah the lord the god of shem now, that's important to get that from, so from now on as we look at our text as we follow the narrative that the lord who is the god the true god is going to be the God of Shem. And so if you want to know the true God, it's the one that Shem is worshiping the Lord. And, and the Lord will often, you'll often see that in the scriptures where the Lord will describe himself as the God of a particular person. Uh, so he's the God of Shem here. Later on, he'll become the God of Abraham. Then he'll become the God of Abraham and Isaac. Then he'll become the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then he'll become the God of Israel. And in the New Testament, how is he referred to? Uh, blessed be the Lord, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. So he's going to be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the, 
how he he attach himself to a, a a physical human being here and identify himself and and that's typical of 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 many religions even in Islam they they identify Allah as uh, Muhammad is his prophet it's the Allah is the, the the true God is Allah the one that Muhammad is talking about and so the Bible says now it's the true God is the Lord who Shem knows him and later on Abraham Isaac and Jacob will know him and so forth so so Shem was the father of the Israelites yeah Shem is that's where you get the term Semitic anti-Semitic right. comes from Shem um, so anyone who is uh, that that's why you have different names for the Israelites. Sometimes they're called uh, Semites. Uh, you know, they're from Shem or uh, Hebrews. They descend from Eber um, or Israel. Obviously, they descend from from Israel. So you have different different names for them. Bless the uh, Lord, the God of Shem, um, and let Canaan be His servants. Mm -hmm. um, God used the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites with the promise of giving the Israelites that land, but he, yeah. they had in order to do that, they had to wipe out the, the Canaanites. And, and they didn't, they though. Didn't know that was but they, they did become, they did take them as, as slaves and such like that. They so, but they, he gives them, he gives their possession to them. So that's that's going to sort of prophesy what's to come of how this narrative is going to going to play out. Uh, we'll see more of that. And then he gives the blessing to uh, Japheth. And that is what? Um, well, in the, in the tents of Shem. Okay. That can and be his servant. Um, of Shem. And Canaan will be his servant. Interesting. So the, the those of Japheth, um, who I think are most of us would be from Japheth, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because that's what they typically say is where you get the European people with Japheth. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I mean, so the Lord will come to Shem. That's where He's going to dwell, and the uh, and the other nations, all the nations, will be uh, coming into the tents of Shem. They're going to come. It's again prophesying that this this faith. It's going to begin with Shem, but it's going to all the nations, as we'll see. Um, and and even even Canaan will be sort of in the tents of Shem in, as a servant, uh, and we'll have certain Canaanites who will become uh, under the be saved. And some who's the most famous Canaanite that gets saved? Remember, who's in the line well, of it, Messiah? It, is it Rahab? Yeah. Yeah, Rahab from Jericho. She would have been one of the Canaanite people. Um, in Jesus' time, too, there's some mention of Canaanite women that he he saves. And all right. All right. So then after the floods, Noah lives. This is the end of Noah. Uh for the, for 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Okay. So Noah lives 50 more years. He dies. 950 years mm. that's where we end you get now instead of noah oh thank you there we go all right i think that'll take care of chapter nine um chapter 10 will be sort of a i think reading through the list of the nations and descendants we'll get to that and then hopefully the tower of babel next next time so any comments last minute questions or where we go no, that's good well, I was I was looking back at chapter eight and I was looking at the length of time it took for the waters to recede. And for the considering it only rained 40 days and 40 nights, it took a very long time for that water to recede. It was 150 days before the rain stopped. And yeah. then it was quite a while before the rain even receded enough that the ark landed on the mountain, and then a long time before the dry the land was dry. I think it was a pretty heavy rain and it was, <laughs> but also burst forth from the deep too. If you remember yeah, uh, that came from yeah. up and above and below. Yeah. But yeah, that's a lot of water. Yeah. In today's times, if you're Jewish, does that, that means that you are of the faith as opposed to from, uh, where you came from. So 
if, if as far as the genial the names of genealogies go, you would say if you're a Jew, you are cons you are from the nation of Judah. Okay. So you're from the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Benjamin too, because that was became part of the nation of Judah. Yeah. So they they're they're called it's interesting because so they're called uh, Abraham is called a Hebrew. Uh, because in his genealogy, Eber is a significant character, and his descendants are the Hebrews. Then you have, um, you know, Israel, the Israelites, all those who come from Jacob. And the among the Israelites will come later on the Samaritans um, and the Jews, your two major groups coming from the Israelites. Yeah, so, but but today, I guess, if you're a Jew, it can be meaning uh ethnically or religiously it could be either uh so all right all right we'll break it here